Good, all right. Um, today we have uh, uh, Don Marolf from the University of uh, Santa Barbara. Don, thank you very much for accepting uh, the invitation. Um, and today's uh, virtual seminar will be on space-time wormholes, super selection sectors, and ensembles in quantum gravity, an overview. Uh, Don, whenever uh, you're ready, I will just, uh, I just remind that it's customary that we have about 30 minutes talk and then about an hour of discussion, but we're not strict and uh, unless you want to, I will not uh, remind you of uh, a time or interrupt you. Thank you, Maurice. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation and thanks especially for your flexibility and timing to accommodate those of us in California. Um, pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, there are many people here that I actually ha have not met before, I think. And those of you that I do know, I probably haven't talked to for quite some time. As a result, there are many, many, many things that we could discuss. Um, I'm going to try to respect the 30 minute time frame and say just a few things today, uh, if giving some very broad brush strokes and overview, and then we'll see where the conversation goes. All right. So I wanna begin by providing a little bit of perspective on today's talk. And, um, oops, yes. And in particular, I wanna emphasize that my talk today is about or it takes place in the context of what I would like to call semi-classical quantum gravity. And by that, I actually mean two different things. The first is that while some of the ideas I'm going to talk about originated within the string theory community, that's best thought of as a historical accident. The things that I'm going to say today have nothing to do with adding novel ultraviolet ingredients to your theory of gravity like strings and so forth. So in today's talk, I'm not going to actually refer to strings. I'm also not, got not going to refer to loops or causal sets or brains or dual field theories or anything else related to the, what I would call the microscopic or ultraviolet description of quantum gravity. So with this little symbol here, I hereby, uh, banish any discussion of strings or other microscopics, and we're gonna talk just about gravity. Whoa, 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 whoa. But there will still be plenty of things for us to discuss and also to debate. I don't mean to say that things I'm going to say will not be, will not require some kind of input. And those inputs, of course, may be controversial, but they will not be microscopic and they will not be ultraviolet. Okay. That's one of the things I mean by saying this is about semi-classical quantum gravity. Oh, and for that reason, I believe that whatever your favorite ideas are about ultraviolet or microscopic inputs to the theory of quantum gravity, this talk should be of interest because it should apply to your approach as well. Okay. The second thing I want to emphasize, though, is that when I use the words, when I use the words semi-classical quantum gravity, what I mean is uh, physics at the level of the WKB approximation. If we were doing quantum mechanics, we would all know what that means. In the context of gravity, it me when I use the term semi-classical quantum gravity, I explicitly do not mean just quantum field theory and curved space. That's part of what you get using the WKB approximation of quantum gravity, but there's more. Just like in normal quantum mechanics, you would have an interesting phenomenon like tunneling, or when you talk about semi-classical physics, you'd be allowed to superpose, say, two coherent states that are macroscopically different. In the same way, when I talk about semi-classical quantum gravity, I want to be able to include superpositions of distinct geometries, and also phenomena that at the moment, in a very broad brushstroke, one could think of as tunneling-like. And again, what I really mean is they arise from something like a WKB approximation. Okay, I hope that's clear and sort of sets the stage. So, um, let me provide a little bit of motivation for some of the things I'm going to do. Um, obviously a question in setting up a theory of quantum gravity is what is it? And again, I'm going to avoid discussions about fundamental assumptions or postulates about the ultraviolet or the microscopic structure. Nevertheless, there is still a question of what is the theory of quantum gravity in various senses. There are lots of things that, lots of questions that arise in gravity that are not necessarily answered by the classical theory and for which we don't have um, experimental evidence for the answers. So we will have to provide some input into the theory. 
And again, even if you have a microscopic approach in mind, as far as I can tell, it's not clear that any approach to microscopic physics has really even formulated what should be done in the most general context. So we've got to do something. Okay, let me, let me um, focus the discussion a little bit more by being more specific. This was all very vague. One of the things that comes up in gravity is that gravity forms singularities. Um, a classic example of this, of course, is what we see when we look at FRW cosmologies. And here's a little picture of a cosmology that expands and then collapses to uh, a singularity at the end. There are many things that make it difficult to understand what is the dynamics of a singularity. One is the fact that the curvature is Planck scale and you know, we have to decide what the theory means at that scale. But another way of looking at this issue is just the following. We can think of the evolution of a closed universe as taking place inside some classical phase space for general relativity. At each time, the universe has some size described by this A of T. Whoops. Described by this A of T. There we go. Those, the size of the universe is naturally thought of as being a positive number. And therefore, the singularity, which occurs at A equals zero, lies at the edge or the boundary of the classical phase space. What that means is, if we're formulating dynamics in this context, we need to understand some kind of boundary condition at the edge. Do we allow universes to flow off the edge and perhaps to go someplace else? Or do we instead impose some kind of reflecting boundary condition at A equals zero that forces the universe to stay in the original classical phase space? The classical theory just doesn't tell us what the answer to that question is. Either one is, is a logical possibility given what we know about the classical theory. And so in order to proceed and discuss physics in a context where the edge might be relevant, we have to make some decision. Okay. I want to emphasize that this is an important decision. The choice of boundary conditions here in a quantum mechanical context will clearly be part of what's involved in defining the Hamiltonian as an operator. Um, and I don't know, well, I'm not quite sure what everyone's background here is, but in the gravitational context, at least for closed universes, the Hamiltonian defines a constraint in the theory and generates a gauge transformation. And as a result, choices you make like boundary conditions that are involved in defining the Hamiltonian affect very important structures like the inner product on physical states. I'm just gonna throw that comment out if it's a, something you're familiar with and it makes sense to you, great. If not, it's just a side comment and we can come back to it later if you want it in a, in a longer discussion. But my point is that these choices are incredibly important. And in many contexts, as far as I can tell, they're not actually dictated by what are usually thought of as the microscopic inputs to the theory. Okay, the story that I'm gonna to tell today really is about making a certain class of choices for boundary conditions at these edges of classical phase space. Um, the particular choice that I'm going to make is a natural one that follows from a certain viewpoint on the gravitational path interval. Here's what's going on. And I will, again, this is an overview talk. I'm not giving all details. And in fact, there are cases where I don't have as many details uh, to present as I might like. Okay, so I want to take the gravitational path integral as a starting point for the discussion. That of course raises many questions. There are many different, whoa, many different kinds of path integrals you might wanna discuss. Um, in part to avoid other questions and distractions, I would like to consider the gravitational path integral in Lorentz signature. And the interesting part about my particular Lorentz signature path integral for gravity is that I want to have a Lorentz signature path integral that sums over topologies, all topologies. This in particular includes examples of the following form. Let's look down here. Um, so this gravitational path integral will have, uh, okay, a gravitational path integral is usually something that we specify 
by giving some kind of boundary conditions for a space time and then summing over geometries that satisfy those boundary conditions. I might decide to consider boundary conditions defined by a boundary which is, has two pieces. So there's two separate pieces to the boundary here, a red piece and a blue piece. And as an example of this similar topologies, there would presumably be some contributions where the geometries that connect to the red and blue boundaries are disconnected. So I have a, I have a disconnected bulk geometry. But a different topology could be something that somehow connects through the bulk these red and blue boundaries. Such geometries, geometries that connect two pieces of a boundary that, that are disconnected in the boundary itself are known as space-time wormholes. The term wormhole is perhaps suggested by this picture. And I wanna distinguish a space-time wormhole from what might be a more familiar kind of wormhole like an Einstein-Rosen bridge. Um, the Einstein-Rosen bridge is something that arises in a black hole context. And the point is that uh, if you have one, uh, a maximally extended crustal black hole that has an Einstein-Rosen bridge, then you'll have two asymptotic regions. Actually, perhaps I'd better draw this this way. You have two asymptotic regions that are connected by the wormhole at every time. That's different from this space-time wormhole where you might ha have slices of the uh, of constant time or things you could interpret as slices of constant time, which go below the wormhole or above the wormhole, and only some of them go through the wormhole. So this notion of a, of a space-time wormhole that I'm discussing is something which is generally localized in time and as, as well as space. And it's just defined as some bulk geometry that connects again, two otherwise disconnected boundaries. Okay. So you folks are really gonna let me talk for 30 minutes and not ask any questions and ask all your questions in an hour and you're going to remember everything. Um, yes, yeah, so I might say then to everybody that if you, if you want to interrupt and ask questions, go ahead. I... Yeah, I mean, I would like to know, I guess, how somebody could define this path integral, but probably that's coming next. Well, it is and it isn't. Um, as I say, my, I'm going to talk about gravity in the semi-classical approximation. So I'm not going to try to define it. I am going to treat it as something we can study by summing over saddle points with small fluctuations around. I am not going to attempt to define it in a fundamental way. I'm going to assume that some person much more clever than I can do so, and I will then, you know, uh, you write down some axioms about it and describe some outputs, but I am not going to attempt to actually define it. Um, okay, one follow-up question. Is there going to be a, some additional sum that is over the possible topology? So, it, 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 you know, this DG looks like a, only a sum over geometries. This is a matter of notation. Um, sure. What I'm going to, to emphasize in this picture is that my path integral does some over topologies. So G includes both metric and topological information as well. Okay. I'm summing over all topologies compatible with a given boundary condition, including in particular those that connect otherwise disconnected boundaries. There is a question in the chat by David uh, uh, Mayer. David? Uh, would you like to, to unmute and ask or? I think Don can just read the question. All right. The question says, often we think about past and future space-like surfaces as boundaries between which a space time interpolates. By your definition, is this a wormhole? Um, So you're thinking about the case of uh, a closed universe where your past and future space-like surfaces are, are, dis are do not connect to each other. You just muted yourself, but I think you said yes. I said yes. Yes. Um, uh, yes, that would include space time. That, that is an example of a space-time wormhole by this definition. So certainly you will not object if I include those. 
Thank you. Yeah, these questions during the talk are useful. All right, uh, I will now proceed. So the fact that I'm including general topologies though, uh, in general context with all kinds of boundaries in Lorentz signature is a little bit unusual and has some interesting features. If I imagine that the boundary conditions are such that in, in some sense, time wishes to flow up this diagram, then the topology I've shown here is somewhat problematic. If I would like there to be a light cone structure in the theory that looks like this, then there really isn't a smooth Lorentz signature metric that I can put on this topology. Instead, there will need to be some set of singularities where the light cone structure does funny things. And you can think about that as happening, well, you can think about that, that, that as happening um, at times where a time is some surface where the topology changes. So when I, when I down here, I can certainly put a normal light cone structure on the space time and also over here and perhaps up here as well, and perhaps up here as well. But there'll be some place where this wormhole branches off, where I can say the wormhole branches off, where the light cone structure just goes funny. And there is no such thing as a smooth uh, Lorentzian metric on the space. I'm going to say that's OK. I'm still going to include these things in my path integral. And so yes, that means my path integral sums over Lorentzian metrics that are not smooth. It includes at least some metrics with some class of singularities. Um, there's much that could be said about that. I'm going to say that for my purposes, it suffices to include a fairly limited class of singularities, um, which I'm not really going to say very much about, except that uh, I'm going to allow these metrics where there are singularities in the light cone structure, on uh, co-dimension two surfaces. For appropriate such singularities, it is still possible to compute, or perhaps better to say, to define in a reasonable way, the uh, um, Einstein-Hilbert action, which is the ingredient for the gravitational path integral. Um, there are various classic papers on this subject. One of my favorites is uh, by uh, Loco, and Sorkin from the early 90s. And I will refer people to that literature for a further discussion. But the short version is that you can see that this has some kind of sense, at least in the case where we have two-dimensional gravity. And it turns out the higher dimensional case is not so different, but the two-dimensional case is most clear. In two dimensions, we have the Gauss-Binet theorem, which tells us that we can relate the integral of the curvature, which is of course the Einstein-Hilbert action, to the integral of a boundary term and an Euler character, which means that we don't actually have to worry about doing this integral through the singularity. We could use the Gauss-Binet theorem to replace it with an integral over the boundary and some topological information. The one trick is that the Gauss-Binet theorem is usually formulated in Euclidean signature. And in uh, Lorentz signature, we need to do a few different things. One of the most familiar is that uh, in Euclidean signature, you'd use a volume element, which involves the square root of the determinant of the metric. In Lorentz signature, you don't want to do that because you want something which remains real. And so you need to put in a minus sign, which of course is like putting in a factor of i. And as a result, there are factors of i that, it can, that can appear elsewhere in the Gauss-Binet theorem. And it happens that the useful version of the Gauss-Binet theorem um, in the rent signature puts an i here with the topological term. So that's something which is worth, which worth, which is worth mentioning, that the Einstein-Hilbert action for such space times is not necessarily real, but can have an imaginary part. But nevertheless, uh, there is a well-defined procedure for calculating the action of such space times. And so I am going to use it. And um, I did not plan to say anything more about this except to, uh, to just highlight this interesting feature that people may wish to discuss further later. 
Perhaps I could jo uh, ask a question. Here's a, uh, hello, Wolfgang. Um, I, so my question is, when you say uh, singularity, these are not curvature singularities, or are they? Or are they rather like topological obstructions or kinds of uh, things like that, or um, regions of your manifold where momentarily the signature changes, stuff like that? There are many perspectives you could have on this. There's a topological obstruction. I would like to think of these singularities or these special co-dimension two surfaces as being Lorentz signature analogs of conical singularities. So when you ask, is it a curvature singularity? The answer given by the Gauss-Binet theorem is that the Ricci scalar density has a delta function in general at these singularities. So what that means is, of course, that, well, all right, there you go. In some sense, the curvature scalar is infinite at those points. But if you stayed away from those points and take a limit as you approach the point, you get a finite answer. Yep. Just like Thank that. you very much. That, uh, uh, that, that is the answer to my question. Perfect. Perfect. So that's, that's why these are nice singularities, because um, you can understand everything you want about them from the Gauss-Binet theorem, and because they really are very, very localized. Actually, they're the nice things they do too. Okay, so that's, this is all just background for my discussion uh, to convince you that allowing these space-time wormholes is not crazy. And could in principle provide a context in which one can do calculations. Oh, um, Don, could I also, yeah. I'm just, uh, I mean, it is very interesting the formula you have there. I just wanted to ask if there is any um, specific assumptions under which you get the topological contribution to, to be purely imaginary, or if this is a general formula. Let me say it's a general formula. Now, th there's a sense in which it's a definition. Um, obviously, in writing this down, there's some set of conventions involved that pick out i as opposed to minus i. But those are really conventions. And those conventions can be applied to any space-time um, which is smooth except for these sort of light cone singularities, except for these uh, problems with the causal structure. Okay, thanks. Right. So I wanted to emphasize that this is the same issue I was talking about a minute ago in terms of what happens when you reach the boundary of a classical phase space. Because again, I could imagine slicing this path integral such that on each slice, I have some nice, well, on the slices down here, I have some nice smooth geometry. And then what's happening is that on the slice that passes through the singularity, I've gone to the boundary of some classical phase space. And by allowing these things in my path integral, what I've really done is to say, okay, if I slice from the bottom, I reach the boundary of some classical phase space. If I slice in the middle, and then reach a singularity, I've reached the boundary of a different, something I would have thought of, thought of as a different classical phase space because the spatial topology was different in the two sides. And by allowing contributions like this to the path integral, I have glued them together in a certain way, a certain way whose details are defined by the calculation in the path integral. Um, so that's what's being done here. I wish to admit that. And again, we can talk about it, but it's a choice that I'm making to, 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 and I think it's an interesting choice and it has interesting implications. And that's where I want to go. All right. Oh, and now, well, let's see, I'm not sure what, you, you told me you weren't gonna interrupt with time, but you should tell me what time you think we started so that I can roughly time myself. Uh, I think you're at about 25 minutes now. 25 minutes. Well, very good. I've, of course, gone through about 5% of the talk, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> that's okay. No worries. 
I will, I will, I will get through the most interesting part and then we'll see where the discussion goes. Sure. So this is all great. I'm talking about a path and a role, wonderful. Um, a lot of people in the audience might say, okay, please give me some physical context. What kind of path and are you computing? And what do you think the numbers it generates means? Well, honestly, I think it's useful to postpone that question a little bit. And instead of putting this in by hand and saying that I want a path integral that computes X, let's start off by asking the path integral what it's doing. Or in other words, let's investigate its properties in some abstract way briefly. So for the moment, let me think about the path integral as a mathematical object, a way of doing some kind of calculation or a machine, it's a function. And what it does is I give it a boundary condition and it computes a complex number. So that was indicated in my pictures. I draw some kind of boundary where I tell it what is the boundary metric, what are the other fields on the boundary, what have you. And the path integral computes a number. To have a symbol for it, I'm gonna call that P. If I write down the boundary condition, I can compute P of the boundary condition. Or I can imagine that someone gives me a path in a row that computes P of the boundary condition. Now, however, to provide some context, I should mention that since I'm talking about Lorentzian path intervals, if I had a non-gravitational quantum field theory, some of the objects that Lorentzian path intervals are good at computing are things like S matrix elements. Um, and that might be an interesting thing to study in real physics, because if I want to study, for example, the information question for black holes, I might be interested in forming a black hole and then seeing what comes out. And that's intrinsically an S matrix kind of problem. So the way that works in this formalism is just that if I want to study a particular S matrix element, what people, which people might call the amplitude to go from alpha to beta, then I write down boundary conditions that fix the state alpha on the past boundary and the state beta on the future boundary. And then I do the path integral and it generates something that I might hope to interpret as an amplitude. Okay. And the thing I wanna emphasize is that problems of this form in a non-gravitational uh, quantum field theory are naturally formulated with a single connected boundary because the past uh, connects to the future if we're working in, for example, asymptotically flat space. Um, if we're working in a cosmological context, things might be a little bit different. Okay, uh, where am I? Um, right. Um, actually, the term S matrix is kind of complicated. I like to think of these as correlation functions of boundary values of, of bulk operators because I could also modify the boundary conditions at this past surface to insert some additional operator there, but that's just a matter of language. Uh, and one other question, one other minor issue. Um, when I talk about boundary conditions, in the context that I'm, in the kind of discussion I'm giving now, it's often the case that one focuses on asymptotic boundaries, thinking about things that are really scry minus or scry plus or some asymptotically anti de Sitter boundary or something that lies in the infinite past or infinite future. Um, in such cases, that's a nice arena to focus on because in such, for such asymptotic boundaries, it's easy to understand when boundary conditions are gauge invariant. Um, but that doesn't appear to be fundamental. I think you could apply these arguments just as well to to finite distance boundaries, as long as you make sure that you're dealing with gauge invariance in some appropriate way on the boundaries. All right. So the contentful part of the talk in a, in a couple minutes. What I want to talk about is just what is the effect of having these space-time wormholes in the theory. Um, and maybe it's better to explain what would happen if you forbid the space-time wormholes first. If you chose to not allow any space-time wormholes in your path integral, you would have the following feature. If you specified two connected boundaries, say one here, um, defined by the red boundary and the green boundary, and a second connected boundary defined by the orange connecting to the uh, purple, and if you then performed your path integral, and if you did not allow any connections between the two, if you did not allow those, 
then you'd simply be summing over all possible ways to fill in between these boundaries and all possible ways to fill in between these boundaries. And there'd be no correlations and no interactions between the two. So the full sum would factorize. You could first sum over all ways to fill in between the red and green boundaries. And later you could do a separate path in the world that just fills in between the orange and purple boundaries. And the original path in the world that had all four boundaries would give you an answer that is just the product of the two. So without wormholes, you have this feature that the path integral operator factorizes, as they say. Okay, so with wormholes in general, you lose that property, which is an interesting thing because, again, the path integral specified by the red and green boundaries is something that you might have wanted to interpret as computing an S matrix element. In a, in a, in a non gravitational theory, that's what it would do. And the same is true for this guy over here. Yet somehow in this gravitational theory with wormholes, when you study both boundaries together, you get something which is not just the product of the two. It's not no longer just a number. There's some kind of interaction between these objects. And the question is, what does that mean? So here's one way of understanding that. Um, a sort of a slightly abstract approach turns out to be useful. Um, again, the path integral is a machine for turning, turning boundary conditions into complex numbers. Um, now, there are lots of contexts in which one finds maps to the complex numbers. And a familiar one is the GNS construction, Gelfand, Nymark, Siegel. Um, that's a construction where you can take any positive linear map on an appropriate algebra, say a C star algebra, and it defines a state from which one can build an entire Hilbert space. So what I want to do is interpret our path integral in that form. Uh, to do so, we should ask the question, does the space of boundary conditions form an algebra, which I could call the algebra of boundary conditions? And the answer is yes. It does so in a fairly trivial way. You can take formal linear combinations of such boundary conditions, given a boundary condition A and B, you could multiply them by complex numbers alpha and beta and add them together. And what you mean by that is that when you insert it into the path integral, what you get is a linear combination of the path integral for A and the path integral for B. Now, that's a formal definition. It may not have all that much content, but it is precisely the way that we normally treat boundary conditions in uh, quantum field theory for path integrals or quantum mechanics. And it's because the boundary conditions in many contexts can be taken to represent states, perhaps mixed states. And this is the uh, way that we describe taking combinations of those states and computing a path integral. There's also a natural product structure on the space of boundary conditions. Given two boundary conditions, we can define a product boundary condition AB, where we say that a given bulk space time M or maybe a linear combination thereof, um, satisfies the product boundary condition if the boundary of M can be broken into two disjoint pieces on which boundary condition A holds in the first piece and boundary condition B holds in the second piece. So that gives some notion of a product. And it's an interesting product because it's, it's abelian because disjoint union is commutative. Lastly, there is a trivial boundary condition, which you might call the no boundary boundary condition, the condition that your path integral doesn't have a boundary and that you're summing over just completely closed uh, to, uh, geometries, which forms the multiplicative identity of this algebra for the trivial reason that if you take the disconnected union of the empty set, a non-boundary with some given boundary, you get sigma b back itself. So the boundary. Uh, but excuse me, uh, yeah. it, uh, uh, me once again. Isn't isn't there an obvious problem now that um, you are missing the C star structure of the algebra? I mean, in choosing boundary conditions, we do something like uh, uh, we choose a Lagrangian submanifold in phase space, but the algebra is uh, so the classical analog of the uh, observable algebra is the entire phase space, not just a uh, Lagrangian submanifold, which 
which is what we plug into the boundary conditions. So at some point there should be some non-commutativity and I don't see where this is uh, showing up here. Could you please clarify? Yes. With the moment, in, in other words, it's like only working with X space and not P space. While in a in in also in the GNS construction, we need the entire algebra, not just half of it, not just X space. We need all uh, uh, X and Ps and polynomials and all possible observables. How does so that show up here? Let me be very clear. I'm using the GNS construction as a piece of math mathematics to decide with what to do with the structure that I have. Um, I am not claiming that these boundary conditions give the full observable algebra in the theory of quantum gravity. Indeed, uh, if I, well, I would I will eventually, if I take sufficient time, clarify that what this is constructing is, if you like, just a piece of the quantum gravity theory. Is that a good enough answer for now? Uh. Uh, I, I don't understand this answer, but perhaps we just go ahead. Okay. I, I just want to say that, that for now, this is a piece of mathematics. Maybe it has less physics in it than you'd like. And as a result, all I want to say is that the boundary conditions form an algebra. And whether it's the algebra that it may not be the algebra that you want, and that's okay. Um, so the yeah, that's okay. Thank you. Don, um, sorry if I missed something, I have a much more basic question. So are the boundary conditions always, um, um, how to say, live on two different uh, hypersurfaces? Because you say A and B, or can they be some sort of uh, closed boundary? Good, so each A is a boundary condition that, in, so let's see. Each A is to be defined by, well, A is some set of full boundary conditions for my path integral. So it's defined by some number of closed boundaries. It might look like that, that's a closed boundary actually. Um, it might be some, it might be a large number of closed boundaries. Okay, okay, okay. And B is another set of boundary conditions associated with some other set of closed boundaries. And you can combine the two using this idea of disjoint union. I see, I see, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is a, um, a linear map. It would be interesting to ask, it, sorry, this is a, the, uh, the boundary conditions form an algebra and sort of by definition, if you will, the path integral forms a linear map on that algebra. It's an interesting question, so it's a linear map, whether the path integral forms a positive linear map on this algebra. And that's a great question. And I don't really know what the answer is in general. In fact, I'm sure I can write down path integrals, at least you know things I could call path integrals, which are not necessarily positive linear maps. However, I'm gonna proceed by assuming that it really is positive, or at least it's positive in a good theory. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to make the assumption that positivity is required in order for the proposed quantum gravity theory to be consistent. And as some tiny motivation for that, I'll mention that it would certainly be positive without wormholes, because without wormholes, whoops, without wormholes, of course, the path integral uh, preserved multiplication. Oops, that was a bad choice of, of nomenclature. Um, without wormholes, the path integral of AB is just the product. And so in particular, for B equals A star, we find something in its complex conjugate and the result would be positive. So I'm going to take as, uh, an assumption that the path integral continues to be positive in the presence of wormholes. In that case, we can use the GNS construction to build a Hilbert space on which each boundary condition defines an operator. Now, as was pointed out a minute ago, this seems highly unlikely to be the full Hilbert space we want for the quantum gravity theory, and it's not, and that's okay. And in particular, it has the interesting issue that all of the operators on this Hilbert space are abelian. They all commute with each other. 
because as I emphasized before, my algebra of boundary conditions is completely abelian. But um, with this structure, um, whoa. Great. Um, we find a Hilbert space and we have a large set of, of commuting operators. Um, and so in fact, the operators can be simultaneously diagonalized. Actually, I haven't emphasized this, but it also follows from the path integral axioms that the operators commute with their adjoints. And as a result, they're normal operators and they can all be diagonalized. All right, um, great. So it's interesting to think about the result as having these simultaneous eigenstates, which are traditionally called alpha states. Alpha is just a, set, a collective label for the eigenvalues. And I think I should finish up this talk by answering the question of how does this crazy, tiny Hilbert space with an abelian algebra relate to the full Hilbert space we might want for quantum gravity? And so the answer is this. I've made absolutely no claim that all operators in quantum gravity commute because as was noted before, I've just been considering certain constructions. In particular, in the construction I've looked at so far, for everything that you might have expected to be an operator in quantum gravity, I haven't really talked about the operator. I've instead talked about the matrix elements of the operator between two particular states. And of course, you know, the matrix elements of any particular operator are actually a number in some theory. So we'll call it a C number. What's interesting is that all of the things that we might have thought would be well-defined operators in the theory, and for which we might have thought there'd be well-defined matrix elements, we've seen actually only give well so all these things which we would, might have thought would be well-defined numbers, which are the matrix elements, are really only well-defined numbers in a given alpha state. In other words, what's going on here, the structure that emerges is that for each of these alpha states, you can build on top of it an entire quantum gravity Hilbert space in which the operators that you expected now act non-trivially. So in other words, the claim is that the full Hilbert space of quantum gravity is in fact a direct sum of Hilbert spaces in a, in a whoops, and that this direct sum decomposition represents a set of super selection rules for the operators that you would have naturally defined um, in say a non-gravitational theory. Okay. Probably, well, perhaps I should stop there. I'm certainly well over my time and there's probably many things to discuss. Although I have a feeling that at some point someone might ask me to say a few more things. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and see what the, where the question and discussions go. Great, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, Don, we're not too much over time. Um, as you say, I, we can perhaps go to the following slides according to the questions, but perhaps first uh, we could uh, go to David's uh, questions in the chat. He has another two. I'll read them for you. Um, I expect uh, you will get to this, but of course in classical theories, a path integral reduces to minimizing the action. When the action has an imaginary part, this no longer makes sense. Does this have any classical meaning? Let me digest that again. Uh, the imaginary, having the imaginary part, the I, chi, does it have any meaning in classical theory oh. is the question. Um, does the I pi have any meaning in the classical, does the I have any meaning in the classical theory? Uh, I think not, but it, it, I mean, uh, risking to say something stupid here, but if I remember, uh, it is related to tunneling in the quantum theory when you have an imaginary part, right? Well, okay. So, so that, is, that is in some sense uh, what one would like to say. Although there's a question of the right language for this. So 
one would like to say that by doing this path integral, where we sum over contributions that have these imaginary parts, that we're computing something like a tunneling amplitude. And in particular, what I'd like to we'd like to think about this, or I'd like to think about this as computing or maybe defining the tunneling amplitude for a tunneling process that changes topology. So this is back to this process business I mentioned of taking two cl different classical phase spaces and connecting them via some quantum mechanical rule. Now it's also, I mean, there are various subtleties in this discussion, um, like the fact that the imaginary part, well, the imaginary part really is topological. So it doesn't change a notion of the classical solutions because it is something that when you vary it, you just get zero. What it does do is to affect the weight of these contributions to the path integral. And with the right signs and the right conditions, it suppresses these contributions relative to contributions that don't change topology. And that's perhaps a good thing because we'd like to think that the, the dominant parts of the path integral in normal circumstances give you know, physics that we traditionally observe and we don't see the topology of space fluctuating wildly. Thank you. Um, let me move to the next question by David, and then we can go to Ding Jia that has raised hand. Um, Sorry, Marius. Is... Um, it's, it has actually a follow-up question. If David yeah, doesn't go, mind go, that... go, Ding, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so um, Don said the uh, um, topology change is suppressed uh, by this imaginary part of the uh, uh, of the action. I remember reading from the literature that. Uh, there are two types of topology changes that say, say Sorkin discuss. There's the Chargers type and uh, there's the Yamuka type. And it seems from the literature, one type is enhanced while the other type is suppressed. And it depends on the choice of sign. If you choose plus signs, one type, if you choose minus signs, other type. Yeah, so I'm choosing one particular sign. And as I said, in most cases, the, uh, changes of topology are suppressed. Um, there are cases where it's not. Um, my understanding of the literature is that it always, there are always unsuppressed contributions. If you choose to suppress Yamuka, the trousers are always enhanced because when you sum over all the topologies, they all exist in the, in the, in the sum and then they have a, a exponential enhancement if you choose the, the plus sign for that case. Well, so this is an interesting story, um, and, and this is, okay. In that language, I completely agree. And uh, in terms of the Loco Sorkin paper, I believe it's true that the Yarmulko topology would be enhanced with the signs that I want to uh, discuss. It turns out, however, that the rest of the path in girl can still suppress the answer. So, um, Again, in the way that I would like to think about these things, these are not by them, well, how shall I say this? Um, It is true that these Yarmulke type singularities can give a local contribution to the action, uh, which is both imaginary and has the right sign, that it appears to give an enhancement to the amplitude. However, it can be the case, and it is the case in many interesting contexts, that when you perform the rest of the path integral over the outside part, it generates a compensating factor that in fact controls that exponential growth and allows the path integral to converge in a nice way and perhaps even gives you a small contribution. 
Now, I haven't actually reviewed this paper recently, and so I'm not prepared to say explicitly what happens in their context and what they were doing. Um, but uh, I, I did recently write a paper about this phenomenon in the context of studying um, the gravitational partition function, trace of e to the minus beta h, using Lorentzian path integrals. And what happens in that context is very interesting. There's a contribution, when you study it using Lorentzian path integrals, there's a contribution from a topology changing process, which is much like their Yarmulke singularity, or, and which gives you a term that involves um, an exponential enhancement in the area of the black hole horizon. But that's something that if you're computing this object shouldn't be a surprise because you would expect the partition function to be something that sums over energy levels, e to the minus beta e, with some sort of density of states factor. And in many contexts, the black hole area does act like a density of states. So to see it showing up in the path integral here with an enh enhancement should not be a surprise. So the real answer involves some integral over possible areas where this transition could take place. And we're performing this integral. And of course, what's true in the context of black hole thermodynamics is that the energy is a function of the area. And so what in this process, it is true that each individual geometry with a certain kind of light cone singularity has an exponential enhancement. It does have a apparently large contribution. However, doing the other parts of the path integral also give you this piece, which is an exponentially small piece. And it's exactly what you would expect to come out of a thermodynamic calculation. Um, as a result, the integral over these areas gives you something that is in fact imminently reasonable and gives you a nice answer. So I don't have a full answer to this question of uh, how these, of, of whether you can always, whether these exponentially large, whether the exponentially enhanced geometries um, really are safe. And I'm not going to give you a airtight proof that this is never a problem, um, but at least in cases that I understand, it turns out not to be. But I'm going to admit that yes, in general, some of the terms in this sum will have exponential enhancement from that from the same phenomena that Loco and Sorkin found for the Yamaka. Thanks. That's clear. Thank you. Um, is there anybody else that would like to ask a question? I do not see any hands raised. Ah, there is one now. David's other question was about this, the star part of the C star algebra having something to do with the orientation of the boundary. Okay, let's go to that first. And then there is a hand raised. And actually, um, that's a good point. I should, I, I should have a better answer than I have to you, but um, in many cases, that's not the relevant point. Instead, the relevant point has to do with the fact that, um, let's see, where were we? I, no. Uh, the relevant point has to do with the fact that I defined boundary conditions, here we go, as an algebra. And so I took these formal linear combinations of the boundary conditions and so the star part just involves complex conjugation on the coefficients. I think there are contexts where one may want to swap the orientation as well, but I have to think, I, I would want to think carefully about what those contexts are before making a, a full answer. But this is the simple part. Yeah, I was thinking of uh, the little book by Atiyah where he talks about uh, topological quantum field theory and the path integral formulation, and there the star comes from the orientation. Yeah, and there are places where that's relevant. Um, there is there is an interesting paper that I'm really not good at summarizing um, by Greg Moore and one of his students recently, uh, well, maybe about six months ago now, which 
recasts a lot of this in the language of topological quantum field theory and talks about how to reinterpret it from that perspective. So I might refer you to that paper for some further, further discussion. Okay, um, we can go to Matthew Fox. Yeah, um, I, I found the claim at the very end quite interesting about uh, writing the whole Hilbert space as the direct sum. I'm wondering if there's an even deeper refinement where you can maybe talk about the tensor product structure of a given H alpha using this approach. You mean the question, does a given, does a given H alpha have some natural factorization? Yep. I have nothing definite to say about that, but I think it's a very interesting question. Thank you. Actually, well, I, I have one thing to say about that. So it turns out that a given H alpha can also be written as a direct sum over, here, I'll write it this way, um, alpha and sigma. Uh, oh, I'm gonna have to introduce, say some more words before I can say this. Um, Well, let me try, because we have time for a discussion. OK, roughly speaking, in a theory of quantum gravity, well, in an old fashioned, you know, from 80 years ago or 60 years ago, Wheeler DeWitt, you know, ge geometrodynamics quantization of gravity, you might think about wave functions uh, of the gravitational field as involving uh, metrics, which in three plus one dimensions would be three metrics that are roughly speaking the induced the metric on some Cauchy surface in a space time. Um, those metrics live on a, a, a say, say three dimensional geometry with some topology that I might call sigma. One of the things which is relevant in constructing a theory of quantum gravity is, well, all right, we're gonna sum over topologies. I'm allowing processes that change the topology of sigma, but I'm also doing this in a context where there's some kind of boundary conditions. So I might think that we need to fix, maybe not sigma, but at least the topology for the boundary of sigma. And that for each possible topology for the boundary of the universe, I can imagine building a Hilbert space for quantum gravity. And so there's a natural sense in which we expect that each alpha can be written in terms of a further decomposition into a sum over, not, uh, a sum over possible choices of boundary topology. Now, here's the interesting thing. I didn't say, well, I didn't say that sigma was connected and I certainly didn't say that the boundary of sigma is connected. So the boundary of sigma might be the union of two distinct topological manifolds, um, which I now need some good name for, but since there are boundaries, I'll call them B1 and B2. So you can now ask whether the Hilbert space associated with, in some sense, disconnected boundaries, you can ask if this is the same as working with one boundary and taking the tensor product with another boundary for space. And you can ask that question. It's not known in general, uh, and I don't think there, well, I'm sorry. Um, one can find things that one would like to call gravitational path integrals um, that appear to give both a yes and a no answer for this. Um, so it's an interesting question whether or not 
well, okay, so this structure, this tensor product, well, okay. So the question of can you build these more complicated Hilbert spaces just by taking tensor products of the simple ones, or do you need to add new ingredients? And it seems to depend on the context. Um, what's interesting is that, let's see, is there, what's the right way to say this? Um, what's interesting is that this, is that while there's sometimes it's equal and sometimes it's not, things only go one way. That is to say, it is always true, sort of manifestly, that if you have a state with boundary B1 and another state with boundary B2, you can get a state with both of these boundaries. So this tensor product is certainly included in this original Hilbert space. The question is whether or not this is an exhaustive construction. Um, and again, sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. Um, Um, don't right now. Yes. Can I, uh, uh, before we go to, I don't know. Um, I, I was wondering how you interpret these numbers. Do you think of them as some sort of uh, probability amplitudes for the realization of a certain space time corresponding to given boundary conditions or as probably the amplitudes for two space times to be connected, or do you have any interpretation in mind, intuitively at least, of uh, uh, what the probabilities uh, would mean in this theory? So let me let me address that in two ways. One is by saying that if we didn't have these space time, or in a, in a one is just by again saying that in a non gravitational theory these C numbers would just be some kind of matrix elements of operators. It would be the matrix element for starting with a given state alpha, perhaps acting with some O and then taking the final state beta. Um, to explain what they really mean in this context, I need to uh, also answer David's question a little bit more about the construction of these H alphas or what they look like. And I need to um, just show you a couple more slides. So I'm going to do that. All right. So what's going on with these H alphas? What, what, what are they, how do we understand them? Well, interestingly, although I've been talking about space times with boundaries and in many cases asymptotic boundaries, there's a connection here to a discussion of closed universes. And what I'm gonna explain is that the alpha label can be thought of as being information carried by the part of the quantum gravity wave function that describes closed universes even if you were trying to ask a question about a space-time that has some asymptotic boundary. And the point is that um, the path integral tells us how to, if we will, attach our original boundary objects with this alpha, beta, and gamma to additional boundaries. So here I can uh, uh, draw some new topology which has additional boundaries here and here. And I've chosen these additional boundaries, I've drawn them as circles. Think about them as a Cauchy surface for some closed cosmology. So what that means is that I could take that, I could, I could choose some particular, say three metric on that surface, and I could multiply it by some coefficients and I could effectively introduce an additional boundary condition here and here, defined by some kind of wave function for a closed cosmology. Again, think of it in this old geometric dynamics kind of fashion that I give you psi of G for the cosmology where G is some kind of three metric. And then we integrate over all possible three metrics here on this boundary. So, Given a wave function for closed universes, the path integral gives a, well, there's a modified path integral, something I could call P subscript psi bar and psi, where I insert again the original boundary conditions, 
but now I get a different object, an object which is not the one that I would have gotten without the psi bar and psi, a different C number. And really, Mario, is the question, the answer to your question, I think, or the right way to address your question is to ask, what does it mean that inserting these additional bits changes these C numbers? Well, in fact, what this G and S construction is telling us is that these sides effectively give you an amplitude for each alpha. So I wrote this down as some psi of three metrics, but that's equivalent to thinking of psi as a function of this alpha parameter. And so these are wave functions in the space of alphas. And what the path integral is really doing when you insert these psi bars and psi's is it's giving you, is, 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 it's, is that this object, which, we, which it, without wormholes would have been a C number, is actually a non-trivial operator on the space of closed universes. And what our path integral is computing is the expectation value of that operator in this particular state psi. That's really, that's really what the GNS construction is doing. It's just reverse engineering this and it takes this data and then constructs from it the alpha eigenstates, if you will. So the moral of the story is that, um, again, the quantum gravity Hilbert space includes this extra set of super selection sectors that you might not have expected, and that the data about which super selection sector you have, or which formal linear combination of super selection sectors you have, is encoded in the wave function associated with closed universes, because if you tell the path integral which wave function you have, it changes these C numbers. Um, I see. Thank you. Um, is there any other? Um, I don't want to monopolize the discussion. Is there anybody else that would like to comment or ask a question? Up oh, here we go. Who is that? Dink. Yeah. Go, Dink. Thank you. I have a related question. Um, I'm thinking along the lines of Mario's previous question: the, the physical meaning of the probability amplitudes. Uh, of course, we do measurements. That's usually how we get probabilities. I wonder whether in the setting, which is pretty general, um, can I interpret and can I associate boundaries to, to myself? Like when I do a measurement, uh, say I, I observe a spin up, say, or, or I observe a, say a roughly flat space time config, flat region of space time, uh, that corresponds to an assignment of a wave, a wave function to a localized region uh, of quantum space time. And can I attach a boundary to, to where I am and, and uh, interpret the, the amplitude computed this way as the probability amplitude for me to observe this configuration given this universe with a global boundary condition? Trying to do things at finite places inside the space-time is always complicated. I would prefer to idealize this discussion and to talk about what happens if we prepare, say, your spin-up or spin-down state at an asymptotic boundary, uh, maybe at scribe minus, and then send it into the space-time. And then perhaps later, if you want, we could ask what happens at scribe plus. Or else we could do some kind of uh, uh, stringer keldish calculation where we really just study things at the past boundary. But nevertheless, this raises a very interesting question. When you talk about experiments and measurements and what's physical, there's a whole interesting story here. Again, I want to remind you that the, the overarching picture I wanted to draw is one in which the Hilbert space of quantum gravity has super selection sectors. So there's, when you talk about probabilities, there's a question of what's sort of physics versus formalism. Um, in many contexts, it is useful to say that uh, superpositions between super selection sectors are not physically measurable. And that when you have a theory with super selection sectors, it is 
perhaps better to think of that as having an ensemble of theories with different values of, well, just an ensemble of different theories. So in that sense, if the theory has a wave function for closed universes, which is not one of these alpha eigenstates and which therefore describes more than one super selection sector, the output from the path integral, even though we put in boundary conditions that in a non-gravitational theory might describe some kind of amplitude, the output from the path integral in this case, because it involves, if you will, an expectation value or an average over these alpha sectors is not something we expect to be directly observable. Instead, what we expect the observable physics is predicted by thinking about um, the ensemble of answers we could have obtained, not in this way, but by putting in wave functions that were alpha eigenstates and then treating the, the, the theory as an ensemble with weights given by the wave function of closed universes. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I hope I've begun to address it. Yeah, yes, thank you, it's, it's helpful. Um... And I'll mention that this is really the interesting thing about this formalism. And it's particularly interesting in the context of uh, the Hawking problem and the black hole information problem. Because the perspective on that issue that this uh, formalism provides is that I will just proceed to, well, I'll just give you a picture is that if you thought about the problem of forming a black hole and looking at its contents as an S matrix type problem, S matrix type, I don't want to necessarily bias the issue by saying that the evolution is a unitary transformation between scry plus and scry minus, so there's an S matrix in a standard sense. But if you think about it as a scattering problem of forming a black hole and then letting it evaporate, what this formalism suggests is that if you just, quote, do the path in a row, or compute a naive answer without specifying that the closed universes are in alpha states. And in fact, if you did it in a naive way using what I would call the no boundary state, which is the state defined by saying that I do not insert any additional boundaries into the path integral, that, what I, that the answer given by this formal calculation should be some kind of should be something which is the average over an ensemble. And that um, the physical way of describing the, the, the answer should be that, well, really, you should go back and do the calculation again for all possible closed universe alpha state wave functions. And then there's some prediction for the class of things one can get. You get an ensemble of predictions. You pick something random. So this has the interesting feature that even if it's true that in each alpha state, a definite pure state on scry minus is mapped to a definite pure state on scry plus, even if what particle physicists call unitarity and black hole uh, evolution is the correct answer in every alpha state, it turns out that when you do the calculation without specifying the state of the closed universes in a, in a, in a in, well, sorry, if you do the calculation with a generic closed universe wave function, such as the no boundary wave function, the one where you do not add in extra closed universe boundaries, what you get out is a mixed state because the dynamics naturally produces entanglement between the radiation products and this label alpha. So as I say, that produces an interesting perspective on this black hole information problem. And as a bit of advertising, although this is not something that I ever intended to fit into anything like a 30 minute discussion, one of the interesting things in the last couple of years is that using exactly the kind of Lorentzian path integral I've described, one can do a semi-classical calculation that appears to back this up and in fact gives evidence that in every alpha state, it is true that a pure state on scry minus 
maps to a pure state on Spry plus. In particular, you can use this formalism to calculate the ensemble average over alpha of the, um, well, here, I'll just say it. You can use this formalism to compute, um, uh, I didn't say it in the right way. You can take the radiation that arrives out at Scry plus before some time. You can use this formalism to compute um, the ensemble average over alpha states of the, okay, so there's some U here, which is the uh, it, retarded time corresponding to the part of the radiation I'm looking at. And you can use this formalism to compute the ensemble average over alpha of, for example, the second Rinne entropy of the radiation here. And you find via a semi-classical gravitational path neural calculation that as the evolution proceeds, this second Rinne entropy rises, reaches a maximum, and goes back down. So that's an interesting output from this formalism that I'm just advertising and trying to explain how it fits into this framework. So <clears throat> are you saying that the information, so the purification comes from storing the information in some sort of tiny wormholes? Is that physical intuition? Here. There are ways of, of, of uh, talking about it. Um, yes, so there is a calculation. So if one starts with this no boundary wave function with this, uh, which is a superposition of alpha states, then indeed what happens in this description is um, the state on scry plus is mixed, but it's purified through its entanglement with closed universes that live someplace else. The wormholes don't really exist anymore. The wormholes are the mathematical description of the formation of those. But uh, people often use the language, these are just words, but it may give you some intuition that this large universe you started with has effectively emitted baby universes. They now live someplace else off in the theory. Um, and, but nevertheless, the full wave function of the quantum gravity theory involves correlations between those baby universes that now exist. Now, time isn't the right way of saying it, but those uni baby universes that are part of the description of the, of the wave function and the final radiation, and that that is uh, what purifies the radiation. Um, let me be a bit critical, mainly to do the devil's advocate, not because I, I think it's, it, it, you know, I appreciate that um, you went constructively. You said, this is my assumptions. Look, this solves it. Let's consider it. But um, somebody might say, look, great. But if I come and add a bunch of things, so you have a problem whether you are, you know, you're losing information. And you say, well, I will add a bunch of things. I will allow correlations with this bunch of things. All these things are unobservable. And this can purify the thing. And of course, I mean, it's like adding a huge environment, right? Um, what would you say to that type of criticism? What was the criticism? I, I heard you summarize some of the things that, I said. That, uh, that um, I could say, look, is, I, have a, I have an issue of uh, information loss. I will just add a huge uh, state space of degrees of freedom. And we will allow correlations with uh, um, the Hawking radiation, the thing that I would not, that I would have liked to purify. And here it is, problem solved. I have a big reservoir. And of course, it's very well known in quantum information theory that if you add the uh, environment, you can always purify any process. Yeah. Is there, yeah. I think what you want to say is, what are the physical predictions of this mechanism? Yes, that's what, I, that's what I'm saying, that this is, uh, there's no real, really any way to check it, right? Ah, there are, there is in fact. Well, yes and no. I will tell you what the predictions are and what can be checked. First of all, these alpha sectors were again super selection sectors. They're, 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 they describe the entire theory. So in particular, it turns out that suppose you do the following. 
uh, actually, uh, David will form an evaporator black hole and collect his radiation. And I will form an evaporator black hole in exactly the same way and collect the radiation. This formalism predicts that, um, okay. Mathematically, it is true that the radiation that David collects is described by a density matrix because it's a, a, by a highly mixed state because it's entangled with the alpha sectors. And it's also true that the radiation I collect can be described by a highly mixed state because it's entangled with the alpha sectors. But David's radiation and my radiation are entangled with the same alpha sectors because there's only one set of alpha sectors for the entire theory, which means that this formalism predicts that when we do our experiments and we compare the radiation sets, they are exactly the same. So this has the interesting effect that um, when experimentalists attempt to measure entropy or Reni entropy, what they often do is construct two copies of a system and then uh, act on the two copies with what's often called a swap gate that uh, um, does a permutation on the systems. And if the two copies of the system were uncorrelated, this would compute the second ring. But in a context like this, where the two copies are in fact correlated because they're both entangled with the same third system, you get results for that experimental measurement of the second ring that are like it's a pure state. And so this is exactly what this formalism predicts. It in fact predicts that um, although, it, it predicts that although Stephen Hawking did a correct calculation and there are no corrections to it, if you actually go and collect these sets of radiation and you try to measure their entropies, it will be given by a completely different expression as if, uh, as if there was no entanglement with the super selection sectors, because after all, super selection sectors are unobservable. And in fact, if you as an experimentalist go and try to study black hole evaporation and you know, find out what happens in various black holes, no matter what the original universe is, the results that you will write down in your notebook will be results from some one definite alpha sector. Of course, there's really an ensemble of you or a superposition of lots of views, which writes down answers consistent with different alpha sectors. But any given you know, example of that notebook will contain the data for one alpha sector, which means that what this really does is although it, it happily agrees that Hawking's calculation was correct and there was nothing wrong with it for what it computes, it predicts that if you go and actually try to measure what happens in a black hole, the results are in fact consistent with the idea that uh, a pure state on scry minus appears to come out as a pure state on scry plus. It's just that until you go and measure various properties of the theory by actually forming and evaporating a few black holes to, to test which state comes out, you won't know which state comes out. You can't predict it in advance because you don't know the parameters of the theory, which are effectively these alphas. I'm not sure I said that in the best way, but I, I, I hope the idea is, is somewhat clear. If not, we can- I, Well, it's, um, yes, it's enough to, <laughs> to think about it. Let me just say something which I'm sure you've thought about. Um, it, it sounds a bit like hidden variables, right? But, so what is it that uh, uh, keeps us safe from um, Bell theorems? I mean, having a bunch of unobservable things that determine what the correlations are going to be between the observable things sounds a bit like a hidden variable theory to me. But well, superficially, perhaps. It's not trying to replace quantum mechanics. It's not saying that, I mean, we're not, it, it doesn't change any, it, it's not replacing quantum mechanical variables with hidden variables. I think there's some language in which you could say it adds an additional set of degrees of freedom to the theory, which happen to actually be hidden variables as opposed to normal quantum mechanical things because they have no uh, conjugate operators because they're super selected. But, but this, is, this is just the mathematics of what happens in quantum mechanics when you have super selection sectors. 
when you're, in other words, it's the mathematics of what happens in quantum mechanics whenever your observable algebra happens to have a non-trivial center. So I haven't modified quantum mechanics in any way. I've merely stated that this path integral formalism seems to predict that the full observable algebra of quantum gravity has a non-trivial center. And I haven't, I haven't, I also have not said that an observable that you might have already hoped to exist somehow artificially becomes abelian. I've merely said there are additional operators that you didn't suspect, which happen to commute with everything. I see. Good. Um, I think, excuse me just one second. Sure. Excuse me, there was a question here in the room. Um, is there anybody else that has a question? And I think we could uh, slowly let uh, uh, Donald go. We are at one and a half hour almost. Um, all right, it seems not. Mm, yes. Don, thank you very, very much. I will now stop the recording. All right, thank you, it was my pleasure.